Pero... Hello. Have a look at all of us. Check in. Today's, um, can you hear me okay? Am I on? Okay. Um, today's talk is mostly going to be about equanimity. Uh, it's it's um, finishing up the seven factors, the tranquilizing factors of calm, concentration, equanimity, but I decided to lean into the equanimity part a bit more. I think um, the theme is, is the attempt that we all have of being con connected with our attention and kind and how that connected kindness, um, the continuity of it can bring uh, more, more and more peace and liberation. Uh, I know that a lot of you probably have never seen the, uh, television commercial that I'm going to describe. Uh, it's actually from the 60s. Uh, and I have a memory of it that always comes up in my practice. Um, but I decided to see if I could find it to see if even my memory of it to describe it was accurate. So to for those of you who haven't seen it, it's a, a commercial on television when I was a kid, uh, a, a serial a serial commercial. In those days, it was sort of the beginning of get, being able to buy cereal, and it was called Sugar Crisp. So I don't know if you've even ever seen Sugar Crisp, but it was kind of taking cereal that was not sugary. It was just kind of bland uh, to, they put a sugar coating on it. They called it Sugar Crisp. Uh, and they had I actually had a different memory of the bear. <laughs> I thought it was a tiger, Tony the tiger, but actually I was wrong and it's a bear and it's he's called Sugar Bear. And Sugar Bear um, keeps, you know, he's in the forest and there's one human, a witch in the forest uh, in a big tower and Sugar, uh, Sugar Bear keeps stealing her sugar crisp. So she has it in a safe way up in the, the tower. <laughs> and so, you can hear it um, at the beginning of the commercial, you see the witch in the tower and then you see Sugar Bear coming and he's kind of looking through all of her sort of garbage around the tower and he can't find any sugar crisp boxes and he's singing. Now this is the significant part of how I want, why I want to tell this story because whenever um, I'm practicing and there's a deep equanimity happening, you know, really genuinely, genuinely not pretending to be okay with what's happening, but or faking it, but genuinely understanding that whatever is appearing okay is okay, right? It's a huge difference between trying to talk ourselves into that things are okay the way they are versus that we actually understand that we don't have control and that they actually are okay the way they are because they're appearing. Right there, there's that just that deep um, peace. It's the the acceptance, the peace of being with things as they are. And when that passes, um, I think for all of us, uh, there's a sense that um, we're not going to be okay. And the reason for this is because uh, the best image I have of that is always the flower bud that you know you've heard over time. That image of our practice and our heart, mind, body being like a closed flower bud, and when the flower bud opens, it starts to open to joy and sorrow, pain, pleasure, neutral, equally. It's like we we can't make a decision in practice to start to open, and oh, I'm just going to open to the good stuff. I'm just you know I'm just going to. I, I'm going to be able to pull this off. You can't. You, you're, you're opening to it all equally. And sometimes it takes 
being able to open to the joy and the pleasant before we can um, be with the pain. It often will give us the strength and courage. It's, a, it's just a natural process. We can, when we open, we can close again. If, if equanimity isn't present, the flower bud can close, as we say, indifference, um, not caring, or we can try to protect ourselves with um, the appearance of the pain with fear or anger, you know, that, or we can, when the pleasant disappears, we can hold on to the pleasure. Uh, but of course, um, when we start to understand this process, we understand that equanimity is the deepest protection, that the wisdom is the deepest protection, the peace with things as they are. It's genuine. We actually do feel okay. <laughs> we do feel reassured. So in my practice, uh, I didn't understand any of this, of course, but I, if I had some equanimity appear, when it, it would disappear, it would have that bittersweet quality and I would take it so hard. I would take it so personally. I, it would be like I would be wailing inside, just the, the longing for that back because I knew that that was the only time I felt okay. So of course I wanted it back. And over time, I started to um, know that I had to take it less seriously, that I had to lighten up. And this commercial started to appear. Now, I don't always like to give yogis commercials, but I don't think there's that many out there that are actually old, as old <laughs> as I am. You had to be a kid in the, in the early 60s. Um, so, so the... Um, the sugar bear is coming along and he starts singing this refrain, which is what I'll do. <clears throat> Can't get enough of that sugar crisp, sugar crisp, sugar crisp. Can't get enough of that sugar crisp. <laughs> it keeps me going strong. And I would sing that, you know, I still do it when the equanimity passes. It's like, it's just, just lightening up around. Well, of course we get attached to that, right? We can't get enough of that sugar. And it's, it's so funny, like it always makes me laugh so hard that I get over like, okay, it's gone, you know, <laughs> and you do the best you can to work with it. Uh, you can look it up. It's called Vintage Sugar Crisp, <laughs> if you're interested, maybe not during the retreat. Um, very important to understand that until we're fully enlightened, of course, we are not going to like it when it passes. The, and that we can start to value the experience of equanimity. I like to think of it as a kind of grace. You can't make it happen. But the more you put your time in of practice on retreat, daily life, you start to, to learn again and again and again. You go through experience over and over and over over and over and over and over and over until you're not chained to experience, until you're not believing that there's a certain experience that's going to make you happy. That all experience is worthy of our attention, that impartiality. So, the teacher Srinazargadatta Maharaj from India said that consciousness, when tainted by memory and expectation, becomes bondage. Pure experience does not bind. Experience caught between desire and fear creates karma. So this, we can see being caught between expectation and memory, past and future, that that's the oppression itself, that we don't see it clearly. And I think that that sense that um, understanding that this is about purifying motivation, that we're, when we're identified with aversion as mine, or we're identified with fear as mine, identified with attachment or craving as being mine, or identified with delusion, ignorance, confusion as being mine, that um, that is the 
samsara. It's like the endlessness of samsara. It's like that's what keeps the karma going, the karma going. Often, if we're lucky in life, if we see a, a boat on still water and it's passing and it leaves awake, it's always very um, moving to understand that we're like a boat walking <laughs> along, you know, still walking. Everything we do, that how we're motivated, every, every action that we're motivated by fear, you know, desire delusion that we're leaving a wake of of karma of that kind of karma that it that's how powerful it is and when we're motivated by the brahma viharas loving kindness compassion empathetic joy equanimity when we're motivated by wisdom there's another totally different wake we're leaving and when we're not identified with any of it there's no more kama, no more samsara, that end of the dream. This is um, from the book, The Late Poems of Wang An Shi, who lived 1021 to 1086 in China. It's called, Just to Say, I close my gate, wanting to end grief, but grief won't go away. Then the spring wind comes, and I want to keep grief close, but somehow grief won't stay. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> it's sort of like... We just want things to be how we want them. We want, and, it, and it's kind of like we want it to, the grief to end, we want to keep it, but we don't have that control. It's so beautiful. So one aspect of the practice is that we go from, understandably, a very self-centered approach to our um, way of being and this self-centered approach is very personal. It's very particular, it's solid, and it's very possessive. And it has ownership in it. Like we own our eyes or we own our grief or it's mine. It's, it's um, it's so self-centered, the orientation. And the practice is meant to, to move toward, not to reject that in any way, to honor it, but to move more toward the understanding that um, the experience isn't personal, it isn't possessive, it isn't ownership, it is uh, universal and boundless. So I'd, I'd like to describe, so in that way, it, um, with equanimity present, our awareness is impartial. So we will, we understand that, that those sensations in our knee are as important as happiness or the sound is as important as grief or whatever is appearing, no matter pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, that there's an impartiality, a choicelessness. And the choicelessness and impartiality isn't based on, uh, the interest in it isn't based on a personal wish. And that's that joy we were talking about today and yesterday, that joyful interest, which it isn't um, dependent on pleasure or pain or neutral. That's the gateway to awakening. And so it's very helpful to understand uh, consciousness itself, how it's appearing and disappearing moment by moment. And to, to understand that we're born into this human body, mind, heart with the six sense doors. So what makes up one moment of consciousness of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, or thinking requires always three things. 
and it's it's described as striker receptor ignition. So for hearing, one moment of hearing, and it's just one moment of hearing, whether it's pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, the three things that are required are the receptor, the, the ear door itself, the striker, which is the sound, and then ignition, it's like the match, right? Touching the matchbox. Ignition is hearing consciousness. So how can we find an eye there, a separate eye there, right? It's impossible. And it's not, this isn't annihilating anything. It's not making anything disappear. It's much more that we understand that what we call a me or a mine or a you or ours, it tends to be a solid um, process that isn't solid. It's just one moment of these three things that arise and pass away. And it happens with thinking or seeing or smelling, tasting, touching. With thinking, it's the mind or chitta. And so the receptor is the mind, that the, the heart center, the mind, which is boundless. The degree of sensitivity of the mind is really unfathomable. Because <laughs> seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching is happening in the, the mind hearing, smelling, there, that's chitta, consciousness, knowing, that's ignition, 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 moment by moment. So with thought, it's like there's a receptor, the mind or the thought is the striker, and thinking consciousness is ignition. And what we learn to do when we're born and in an infant, certainly an infant isn't able to glue this all together yet, they come in boundless formless <clears throat> and the first years of our life we're learning to glue this all together and say oh <laughs> my foot <laughs> right we know and one of the things i love about being with little kids is as i love to play i don't push it too hard but i'll see them playing with their favorite toy and kind of i'll come over you know if i know them i don't mean if i don't know a kid but if i'm playing and then i'll come over and touch it and, and i'll say mine they don't like that at all it's like and sometimes it'll they'll get a glint in their eye but they actually have no interest in sharing it and they shouldn't they're they're, they're mostly they're at the age where they're supposed to be learning these healthy boundaries they don't have them you know, so that like they'll go, no, it's mine. And I just love that stage of development because they, we actually need to go through that stage. If we don't, we, you know, we end up with so much, du you know, dukkha on the planet because people at 40 are still going, mine, <laughs> no, actually mine, right? They haven't gone through the developmental stage. Probably some aunt did come by and take it, right? You know, there's still, uh, I don't do that, but I just find that kind of teasing a little bit kind of is fun and they like it actually. They like that feeling of like, oh, you know, they know they're, they know they're at that stage. They're not stupid. They know they need it. So the striker receptor ignition happen simultaneously in one moment, but they're distinguishable. And the, the training in meditation practice is, is learning how to be mindful of all three. So we understand more and more deeply that what we believe, what we've learned to believe to, to try to find a healthy sense of oneself uh, developmentally, what we believe to be mine or me or mine isn't on this other level. You don't reject it. So sometimes if this very deep old anger appears um, in the mind and it really feels like mine, you don't hit yourself and say, oh no, not mine yet. You really try to experience it unfolding as mine. And that respect for that and that interest in it will eventually shift to like being able to appreciate, oh, on this wise level, it isn't mind but we when when especially if there's been denial in any way of something 
then you have to go through that process of the respect for it unfolding on that level so that then we can open up to that deeper level of understanding of wisdom. So when we, when we can understand even a little bit, when we're hearing or seeing, et cetera, I think that um, it's such a gift because we get to see, oh, this is actually insubstantial. This, it, it's not possible to control it. It's going so fast. We are gluing it together. I, 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 uh, I find it really important for most of us to practice this with a, our easiest sense door to pay attention to. So we don't try to understand it with all six usually. It takes time to understand it with the easiest, a little bit and a little bit more. And then you start to see, oh, I can, uh, I can pay attention to this with the breath or some physical sensations or hearing. It's a process of just um, doing as much we can of trying to explore it without um, forcing. So always beware of forcing. And in this process of understanding striker receptor ignition, we actually get, oh, we actually can't hold on to it. It is uncontrollable. Do you see the difference? It's like that when we understand it's uncontrollable, that's what cuts through the belief that we can control it. It's not a, um, something that just goes through the thought process. It's very visceral. When I was um, really young, I, I don't know where I found this. It's I just one sentence. It was from a poem from an old Chinese poem. I don't know where I saw it. Uh, and I haven't been able to find it. But the sentence was, uh, the blue of the sky touches my shoes. And, it had such a powerful effect on me. You know, I was very young and not exposed to any of this, but I knew that was my path. That's how powerful it was for me. It was like, wow, that's really different than what I grew up in the early 50s with, right? <laughs> it's just like, wow, was I grateful? I don't, I can't say I understood it, but I certainly would say it to myself over my lifetime. As a as a nav way of navigating, the sky isn't out there. We're seeing it right at the <laughs> receptor, right there. It's not. There's no inside, no outside. And the blue sky is touching our shoes, literally. It's not a metaphor. So we come from this timelessness and boundlessness and we, we navigate through coming into form and um, personal, hopefully learning personal healthy boundaries, which a lot of us didn't. And so it's like a process of actually having the practice help us find that. And in that process, I think we really find um, stewardship. And so that like, you know, you'll hear as the, uh, ecology movement, you know, was swept along. It was like this shift in terms of ownership of land to steward, stewardship of land. But really, when we take birth into our body, it's the same. It's, it's just a part of the earth, sky, universe that we're born into that we actually have responsibility for. That's the karma. No one has more responsibility for our body, mind, heart than us. And that, that opening up beyond that sense of a self-centered um, boundary to, again, with the practice, it can help us if we're not so good at stewardship of ourselves. The practice helps with our own body, heart. Maybe we're more interested in stewardship of anything but our own body, right? But if you practice, it'll heal it. 
your body will eventually scream for attention or your heart will if you pay attention. You won't ignore the cries. Sri Nisargadatta says that all consciousness is sharing. And again, just seeing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. It's like one moment, all, all is included in one moment. This is why that in terms of seven factors, the emphasis on the, the enough concentration, that stillness in the surface of water, the surface of a pond, surface of a lake or ocean, it's like the whole sky is reflected and all the depths are reflected. It's all there. That's why we come to stillness. So we can start sensing, oh, hearing, the sound isn't happening four miles away. It's happening at the ear door. Oh, I don't know if this is... Uh -huh. This is um, from Wang on Xi again. It's called Life at Samadhi Forest Monastery. Wait, the names of the monasteries are so um, compelling. <laughs> Life at Samadhi Forest Monastery. A stream when, oh, sorry. A stream winds around my home. Mountain around bamboo. Mountain and stream always there, even among white cloud. On a boat gazing across the stream. I'm the mountain adrift. It's an idleness stream. Birds and mountain wildflowers share. I'm the mountain adrift. It's an idleness stream. That's the non-doing awareness. Idleness is non-doing awareness. It's an idleness stream. Birds and mountains, wildflowers share that we all participate in. So we had that initial title of the, co of the course, Seeing Security Everywhere, is that peace that happen can happen in, with the equanimity and mindfulness, the equanimity, sixth sense door awareness, striker receptor ignition, gone, striker, <laughs> striker receptor ignition, gone. But I can't say it as fast as it happened. It's like a flicker of a candle and it's extinguished. It's a lighting of a, of a wick. It's a lighting of the wick. It's extinguished over and over and over and over and over until the wick isn't lit anymore. So when, we're, when we really aren't motivated by greed, hatred, and delusion, that absence, that absence of the presence of greed, hatred, and delusion, there's no longer the controller and controlled. Not, there's no doer, there's no controller. That's all a doer is, is greed, hatred, and delusion. And, and as we, again, it's a gradual understanding of this, we, we actually get a better relationship with greed, hatred, and delusion a better and better one, not the sense that, uh, that they're so oppressive. We start to see that, oh, it's just a moment of wanting or a couple moments of wanting. We don't have to buy into the object of the wanting. We don't have to buy into the object of the fear. 
we just experience that movement of the fear through our system like we would, again, the sound of a bird happening or a cloud in the sky happening. We relate to the all experience just like we would the sound of a bird. We relate to all experience as we would a cloud going through the sky. That's the seeing security everywhere or the impartiality. And it, as, as, as you can see in yourself, like there, it requires this um, willingness to explore this, to not be afraid of identification, to not be afraid of the experience of when something feels like mine so intensely and it feels imper permanent, to not be afraid of that, to see that as all part of, oh, well, that's what a little me is. <laughs> I get it. That's all it is. It's okay. And actually to really have so much metta, so much compassion. That's when we need the most metta. And we're, that's usually when we're ready to kick the can down the street, right? You know, little me, you know, instead of like, oh, little me needs a lot of compassion and care. And when the, um, this, um, this understanding of uh, the insubstantiality and the fleetingness and the dissatisfactoriness of experience itself, that as we start to understand that more and more, you know, it deepens and deepens. It, it's just that stewardship that has become so apparent. And in some ways, for me, I found it's actually easier to try to take care of myself. That's one of my karmic knots, trying to take care of myself. I still, you know, I remember I told some of you a couple of years ago, I had gone to the dentist and I, you know, I didn't really have mothering. So even like brushing my teeth, it's always like, okay, night, time, morning, you got to brush your teeth. It's not that I don't want to do it, but I'm not really interested in brushing every tooth, right? And, and really taking a lot of time at it. And this, you know, dental hygienist, <laughs> I, <laughs> she was really fierce. Wow, man, she was like, you know, you're still, still not really making any progress with your dental hygiene. <laughs> you know? I'm like, what are you talking about? I was like, I floss, like I brush, now I got an electric toothbrush. And she's like, well, you're, you're really not taking enough time with every tooth with the electric toothbrush. And I said, well, how much time? And she's like, a minute, you know, like really like, you know, do this thing. And it's like, and it's astounding to me. It's like, really? Like, and then I'll be driving away and I'll be thinking, I can spend hours weeding marigolds, right? I can spend forever in the garden, but like with my teeth, you know, and I love my teeth, I care about them, but it's just like such a block. But I start to see then, you know, I walk out of the garden and it's like, ding dong, ding dong, you actually, actually aren't impartial. Right, and I have to remind, oh, yeah, the happiness of taking care of myself. I, I tend to have a cynical voice that can say it sometimes. Oh yeah, the happiness of taking care of myself, you know, but it's like, okay, that's where I need work. And I think for all of us, maybe that's not your teeth, but it could be your emotional world. It could be some aspect of your emotional world or some aspect of your physical world or perhaps relational right, with other people. It's like, if you know, we're not born perfect, we're not able to attend to all of the sixth sense or moment to moment awareness perfectly. It's like learning how to do the best we can. And that that's really wanna, where I wanted to end up with this part of the talk. It's like, to do the best we can with taking care of ourselves and others, that, that includes ourselves, others, the planet, out of that understanding that we take birth here and that it's our responsibility, but also that it's everyone's responsibility. Each person is responsible. We're not overly responsible for another person's karma. 
we have to give everybody responsibility for their karma. That doesn't mean we don't care, and we don't try to help, but it's also getting that that's a gift. It's a gift to help people understand the responsibility. And then there's the karmic knots, the, 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 steward, the stewardship for the karmic knots, of course, tends to be the nature of a karmic knot is that we don't really want it to be a lifetime learning, right? It's like we really do believe that we should be able to get rid of it somehow, this fear of death or the fear of rejection or, you know, wanting more or whatever the karmic knot is or the several karmic knots, that often they come in a cluster. I think that there's a learned resistance because we think it's a failure that we can't get rid of them. That somehow we believe more deeply than anything that a karmic knot, maybe it's shame, but it's like we, we just think that the practice should have helped us get rid of it instead of what? Get a relationship of more and more wisdom and love with it. So the, this, the, the kind of shifting from something feeling so personal like a karmic knot and how they appear to the unbinding of the karma, to me, I think that the karmic knot um, human predicament, uh, that these karmic knots teach us the most. They're so humbling. They're so not under our control. It's awesome, you know, that, that you have to follow them. You have to have such grace and such tenderness and care and exquisite patience. We mostly see our impatience, not the patience, but it, it will grow. And with that growth, there actually is less need to get rid of them. There's more interest. And we do see, oh, this is my lifetime teacher. There, it shifts from wanting to totally get rid of them to total gratitude. Um. I've noticed as I get older in life that uh, I tend to pay attention to the generation that's like next in front of me is sort of like, oh, this is where I'm going. So like when I was five, it would be people eight and 10, right? It was, or 11. And so now that I'm gonna be 70 at the end of the year, I'm looking at people in their late 70s, 80s. It's like, well, if I get there that far, that, wow, you know, and man, the 80s looks really, um, something else. I find it quite amazing. And there's two people I know more closely. Well, not the, I'm going to describe um, this neighbor across the street. And as because I've been injured, my little world is shrunken uh, so that I just walk a little bit out on the road in front of my house. But I, I walk farther than her. And I've actually, I'm seeing neighbors I've never seen before because I usually take off far and I'm sort of in this one little area. <laughs> and I walk to the left when I leave the house rather than to the right. So there's this whole new world opening up for me. Um, so it turns out this, this woman, uh, I've just discovered, it's amazing. She comes out her driveway and there's a little hill there. And she walks up the hill backwards. And then she walks down. And then she walks up backwards. She walks down. And she walks up backwards. And who knew, right? Like I just, <laughs> I'm finding it so, so joyful to actually see her routine, which is very different than every anything I've ever seen. And I've bumped into her <laughs> walking, well, you know, walking backwards up the hill. And uh, another side story is that 
she had a renter and a, like her garage that she turned into a little rental. She's had a, the renter a couple there for 23 years and they moved out a few months ago. And there's this exquisite tree that growing there that was um, the man who lived there. It, he just loved this tree. It was so hard for him to leave. And it's just beautiful. The orange flowers on it are, are peaking right now. So the, the other day I, I came to the end of the driveway. The tree's kind of far away. And I put my phone on the Zoom as far as I could. It took a picture and sent it to him. They moved to Arkansas. Um, and I didn't know it, but she saw me taking, taking the picture. And she said this morning, well, no, the, two, two mornings ago, I went by her, but I hadn't seen her going backwards. So she said, who, who, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm sending the photo to, you know, this person who used to live here. Uh, So last, last night at the uh, end of the day of teaching, at some point I went outside and in this very obscure place on the top of the driveway right outside the house, which means that she walked all the way over from her place. I don't know if she went down my driveway, up my driveway backwards or not, which would have been fun to see. Um, but she left this uh, very old fashioned piece of paper that I would have not seen since I was a kid. And uh, she had all these rocks in it, so she, it wouldn't blow away. So it was all covered with dirt. And uh, it looked, I opened it up from the um, rocks and she had drawn a picture of that tree. And, uh, and then underneath it, it said, um, I invite you to come look at my tree. <laughs> and it just um, I think when we're in our 80s this is very very important it's kind of like it's more like when we're four or five and the same thing would happen, right? We, we very much need to understand that the world around us, it's not far, it's very close. Uh, and I've grown, I've grown to care about her so much and don't even know her very well, but I know she values uh, the friendship. And I think that I have a, I had a neighbor that lived across the street from me when I was a kid in Framingham, Massachusetts uh, that I stay in touch with. And she's also in her mid eighties. And I'm much more in touch with her. You know, I know her well, and I've been trying to kind of stay more in touch as she's uh, getting so old. And some, I, ha, I don't have that much time, but, some, but sometimes I'll send her a picture or a little quote. And every time I send something, the way she sees it is so different. It's kind of like watching the neighbor go up and down, <laughs> like up the, up the road backwards. It's like she sees something that I just never see before. And she comments on it in a way that's very light. But I've known her since I was 10. Um, and she didn't come to that joy and lightness easily. And she was a uh, very um, active politically, started the first Planned Parenthood in, in at least Eastern Massachusetts and was very active in many different ways. Um, and suffered so much over how things are in the world. It's so open and so caring and suffered so much. And I, I never, she never was able to access that joy. She did a meditation retreat before I did. Uh, 
she did one in 1974. <laughs> I did one in 75. And I lived in northern Maine then, and we didn't even know each of us had done it. But it's like, um, I feel like the sense of understanding that the human world actually does have a range of joy and sorrow. And I've seen this friend go from really caring and not nothing, I'm not saying that was bad or wrong at all, but just watching her need to actually open up to joy as she's gotten older and include the other parts of her life and the, the, the pain in the world. Uh, but also I sense that um, she's been able to have more equanimity and lighten up. So the moral of the story is really the 80s don't look so good in terms of the body. <laughs> I mean, the 70s don't look that easy, man. But the, the mind, can be so much more liberated. When I was in Burma, not uh, this year or last year, but I guess it was the beginning of 2020, right before the pandemic started. It had started. We didn't know it. Um, and one of uh, my dear dear uh, monk friends that lives up in the hills in the Sagain Hills behind the Chazwa Monastery up in Upper Burma. Um, I, there's not a lot of the elders left for me there. So he's actually 11 years younger than me, but very dear. And uh, I was telling him I was going to do a self retreat soon. And I, I just said, he said, well, how are you feeling about it? And I said, it's good. My body is getting much harder, you know. And he just laughed and he said, well, that's just how it is. That's just the way it is. <laughs> it gets harder for your body when you meditate as you get older. But he said, but your mind can be fine. You have to keep remembering their mind can be fine. Like, yes, they know, yes, they know. But it's really important to, re to see that and remember that. So when we ask ourselves, you know, where, where, you know, in the practice or in daily life, it's like, what can I do to lighten up, you know, if it's getting too much too hard, I think that that's, we can learn a lot from 80 year olds and people older, that you can see that because often their life has become much more restricted in terms of how far out they can move from where they live. But, but if you see how much joy they get from seeing a flower. Or hearing one bird, not 5,000 birds, that, that it does become more singular like that. And, and uh, we can learn from that. And it's just like learning from a little kid. It's like you follow a little kid around anywhere in a store <laughs> or in, you know, in a, on a lawn or anything. It's like the littlest thing becomes so um, wonderful. Yesterday, or two, it might've been two days ago, just at dusk, just for the first time, I feel like I've lived here a long time. And there are these big toads, they're called bufos. They, they're not um, from Hawaii. I'm not sure which country in Asia they're from, but they're very big. Uh, and for the first time I saw a newborn bufo. It must be spring. I mean, it seems like it's summer, but there still seem to be little beings being born. But this was smaller than my thumb thumbnail, just my, not a thumb. It was smaller than my thumbnail, probably half the size, very camouflaged. It was in the drought 
uh, colored grass and I saw it jump. <laughs> it's just like, wow, right? So we might think, well, what does this have to do with anything? But actually, as we've been saying, it's like if we're, if the heart is closed and we feel hopeless or depressed or even the, that stream of dissatisfaction that the Buddha taught runs from the runs through the human mind. Why are we surprised by it? It's the third army of Mara. The third army of Mara is that there's a stream of dissatisfaction that runs through the human mind. Why, why, why do we need a little discipline to find some something that will lighten us up. It's a discipline. It's not just going to grab us and take us. It's going to be something we actually make space for. And sometimes it takes a long time. I know I have a friend in New York City, and she makes sure she looks at the sky out the window. Now, there's a lot of buildings. But there's also a lot of sky she can find. Sometimes she has to walk far to find the sky, but she cultivates it. It's, it's so important to remember, we make time for so many things, but do we make time for a little joy? And how that affects liberation, right? The, the, the connecting the kindness, the equanimity, and where in that is there a need for sometimes remembering that this human world has the joy and sorrow. It's not a form of control. It's a form of <laughs> the heart surviving. Okay. Mm. This is from Henry David Thoreau, and it's from a book called um, Thoreau's Wildflowers. It's from um, a little ahead of the solstice, but July 2nd, 1852. Last night, as I lay awake, I dreamed of the muddy and weedy river on which I had been paddling and I seemed to derive some vigor from my day's experience like the lilies, which have their roots at the bottom. I have plucked a white lily bud just ready to expand and after keeping it in water for two days, have turned back its petals with my hand and touched the lapped points of the petals when they sprung open, when they sprang open and rapidly expanded in my hand into a perfect blossom with the petals as perfectly disposed at equal intervals as on their native lakes. And in this case, of course, untouched by an insect. I cut its stem short and placed it in a broad dish of water where it sailed about under the breath of this beholder with a slight undulatory motion. <clears throat> the breeze of this half suppressed admiration <coughs> the breeze of his half suppressed admiration, it was that filled its sail. 
It was a rose tinted one, a kind of popular aura that may be trusted, methinks. People will travel to the Nile in Egypt to see the lotus flower who have never seen in their glory the lotuses of their native streams. Liberation is at hand in your bathroom. It's not in some monastery 10,000 miles away yet. It's like we have this idea that somehow it's somewhere else but this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment. Let's sit for a minute. Just as there's no need to go to the Nile to find a lotus in bloom, there's no need to take one step from where we are to find our heart in bloom. So we have time for practice another half hour or so before the uh, meta chance that it's so important to try to do all together. <laughs> 